Again, thank you. I'm going to hand over immediately to the moderator, Mr. Kenyan, who is begin the conversations. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Wona and the Next Year team. I want to thank you for the opportunity to moderate uh, this dialogue. Um, I want to also um, welcome uh, uh, and introduce our speaker straight away. As I said, my name is Kenny Anui, and I head the Nigeria Electrification Project funded by the African Development Bank and uh, is under the Rural Electrification Agency. So our dialogue today is on critical decisions for uh, the power sector. Uh, some of the main discussion points today we traverse market liquidity, strengthening market regulation, uh, investor perception, and political interference. Uh, as I said, I will now introduce our speakers for today. First, I'd like to make welcome the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, uh, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed. Uh, secondly, the CEO of ZJK Energy Partners Limited, Rumundaka Winodi. Welcome to the session as well. Uh, thirdly, I want to welcome the principal consultant, MTech Energy Services, Ifi Ikeonu. Welcome. And finally, uh, last but not the least, I want to welcome the head of uh, the Economic Development uh, uh, for the Department for in International Development, uh, UK, Gail Warrender. You're also welcome. At this point, I want to ask uh, the speakers by the order in which they have been introduced to please make their opening remarks. Honorable Minister, you have five minutes, please. You may begin. Well, thank you very much, Kenny. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's nice to join the meeting. Um, the Nigeria electricity industry has had a history of a lot of non-performance, to say generally. And from the financial side, our assessment right now is that we require at least an average of 85 billion per month to pay for gas bills, generation, transmission, and distribution operations. The Nigerian bulk electricity company, the one that we call Lambert, buys all the energy uh, right now at an average of 4,100 megawatts from generating companies and sells to distribution companies. The collections from the consumers is typically about 42 billion per month, while the federal government then has to provide the PDC support, averaging about 25 billion per month would be for the, to cover the rest of the unpaid bills. This leads to, has led so far to a massive debt stock um, uh, and with interest building up by the federal government, for the federal government. In the past, several interventions have been executed by the federal government. We have had at some point to um, access financing from the central bank and uh, in, the, in, in the initial sum of 701 billion uh, in a facility that we call payment assurance facility. Um, about a year ago, we have had to extend that facility with another 600 billion, bringing the total from central bank to 1.3 billion Naira. We also have been discussing most recently with the World Bank to extend financing that is up to 350 billion, uh, $3 billion to the Nigerian electricity industry. So this is funding that will come in tranches of 750. Part of it will be to government, part of it will be to the sector uh, directly. So we, we are requiring significant fiscal resources um, and because currently we're expending so much on tariff shortfalls. And it's clear that the tariff shortfalls that we're paying is, is subsidizing the richer households uh, because 60% of the funding benefits that we now are expanding is benefiting 20% uh, of the households, which are the, the, the richer households. We are working currently to turn around the power sector because it's critical to unlocking economic growth, particularly in the north as all sector of the economy. 40% of the Nigerian population, to be up to about 80 million people, lack access to grid electricity. 
Nigeria therefore ranks one of the um, uh, countries in the world that has the least um, measurement in terms of access to, to, to electricity. So whatever we need to do in terms of engaging citizens, engaging different stakeholders, to make sure we turn things around is uh, we, we are doing. And that's the reason why I'm here today. On the part of the Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning, we've been working together with the Power Ministry to um, re, uh, reinvigorate the Power Sector Recovery Program, which was approved since 2017. And it contains a set of measures that is meant to turn around the power sector. It has not worked as planned. We, uh, we've examined it and identified what we need to do to be able to turn things around so that we set back uh, the, the, this electricity sector on course to enable, to enable us con concentrate on necessary policy and regulation that is required to move the sector forward to ensure that there's physical and financial sustainability to also ensure operational efficiency of all of the participants in the, in the sector and also to improve on the network infrastructure. The uh, financing plan associated to support this power sector recovery plan has been concluded. We have um, been engaging financiers that will uh, be willing to provide funding to the financial, uh, financing plan. This financing plan was developed using a multi-agency uh, um, process and it adheres strictly to the principle that we must make sure that it is performed, that when we come to the point when we have to review tariffs, that the uh, lifeline tariff, which is meant for the poor and the vulnerable, is maintained, that tariff is not increased at, at that level. We also are working to make sure that the whole of the electricity industry improves on its connections so that governments responsibility in trying to bridge the gap is significantly yeah. uh, is significantly reduced. You said five minutes, I'm sure. Tell me when I'm done with the five minutes, otherwise I might take another another five minutes. We also are working very quickly to establish a credible and realistic, physically affordable, as well as a proper financing plan. And yes. all of this is being done even as we're trying to improve infrastructure, to improve operational efficiency, to review the commitments that we have entered into as we, as we uh, privatize the, the, the sector, uh, review the contracts that we sign. Uh, some of them are not working well and are not in favor of the, uh, of the country. So we're engaging the generation companies and the distribution companies, even as we try to fund more the transmission uh, aspect of the business so that more of the generated power can be willed and more can be distributed and actually used by, by the consumers. This is supported by at the, at the, at the market end trying to provide more meters uh, within the country. The, the, the regulator NERC has licensed meter asset providers. We're working with them to see how we can ease uh, uh, the bringing in of meters as well as components to assemble meters locally so that most Nigerians that have electricity will be metered and, the, and then the tariff uh, will be, will be uh, more easier to adjust when people are sure that they, have been, uh, that they are paying for what they consume. Thank you, Anambu, Mr. Yes. If you don't mind, Ma. Um, we will probably come back to some of these um, uh, 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 in the conversation as we progress. But if, if, if we may just uh, stop you there and um, uh, invite Rumudaka to make his opening remarks, please. Okay. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Um, uh, Kenny, thank you very much. And um, uh, I would like to also um, thank the uh, Electricity Hub for this opportunity to be in a panel with the uh, Honorable Minister uh, herself. Um, the, the topic of the discussion, as, uh, as I understand, is you know, the issues around tariffs and uh, you know, the uh, political interferences, uh, as it may be, on the issues of tariff that 
uh, to a large extent leaves the industry without some, um, with what we call cost reflective tariff, right? And, you know, for me uh, to examine this, we, we really need to go back to, you know, the, the intent of the reform as it was started, which was that at some point the government believed that it could not continue to uh, fund this electricity sector. There is an economic uh, thing around it that could actually allow the private sector to come and play a role. And uh, the private sector playing a role would mean coming with private capital uh, for uh, private ownership, operatorship control, and, and what have you. Uh, the ultimate being that at the end of the day, homes and businesses will enjoy greater and better enhanced power supply. And uh, with that, we went about uh, the privatization. Now, when it comes to regulation and private capital, you have to, uh, we have to understand that private capital will only thrive where there is a stability in the environment. And therefore, where you have issues of uh, interferences that seems that the regulation in itself is ad hoc, then you see that a private capital will not come in. And things that lead to this is not just uh, the, the fact of the regulation, but also the type of services that the operators uh, provide the consumers. So you, you see this talk that goes where consumers are asking, should we really be paying the additional cost of service when, you know, what is the benchmark service? And uh, for the operators that are asking that, you know, we cannot do any better unless we are allowed to charge the tariff. And in between is the government that then ends up trying to shoulder and provide subsidy and provide gaps in the industry, exactly the same reason why it wanted to exit the market. So at the end of the day, it seems that after privatization, government, the Minister of Finance has to continue to look for money to support the industry instead of using that money to support social programs. That was the intended means. So uh, if unless we solve this and find a way to get this resolved, then we'll end up with an issue where, you know, all the intents are not a uh, are not realized all the goals. We, we don't have additional power supply to consumers and the government continues to fund that. So I welcome the topic and I look forward to more uh, discussions on this because uh, it is a critical point for the industry. We cannot continue uh, uh, this way. There must be a turning point. Thank you. Kenny, you're mute. May, may I welcome Ms. Ife Kiono to make her opening remarks? All right. Uh, thank you, Kenny. And then let me uh, join the rest of the panelists in the Nigeria Electricity Hub for this opportunity to be here you know, with, um, with a panel of other distinguished um, as in the power sector. Uh, my opening remark will be quite brief, basically. I just wanted to start on the point that the issues that we'll be discussing today, for me, lies at the soul of the effectiveness of the power sector reform program, which uh, government had embarked on, I think, some 20 years ago. Remember that about 20 years ago when the government decided that uh, the power sector should be reformed as an option, you know, migration, the need to infuse capital into the sector, you know, knowing that uh, at that stage, and government um, had spent quite a bit, and uh, there was a need to, as a way of improving performance, both technical and managerial. And consequently, uh, that in itself would also lead to, you know, a lead to improved services and customer 
uh, and content. Uh, a lot has happened. The bus sector did happen. We had a we had a privatization in 2013. Uh, seven years down the line, um, indeed, we are at a critical path. A critical path in the sense that there was um, the expectation that a number of things would happen following the reform program and the privatization. We had expected that uh, the government would have been relieved of the huge spendings, which the Honorable Minister has so told us about in her opening remarks. That was one of the core expectations as that you know, especially from the um, from the part of government um, of the government. There was also that expectation on the part of consumers that services we are going to improve, that well, you know, that uh, we'll have a situation where we'll have to deal with less and less outages and who we're, we're looking forward to really state our surface that we are now playing in the private sector that you would have uh, that would also make it uh, easier for them to offer improved services and thereby also ensure that the customers are satisfied. That obviously has not happened and that is part of the reason why we're having this discussion today. I think that the tariff itself is not just a standalone thing, just like the political interference issue is not a standalone and all of that. This needs to be looked at holistically knowing clearly that for us to properly review why, you know, so far down the line, we still haven't gotten to where we are. We need to really thoroughly, I mean, those core issues that have made it difficult for us as a country, as consumers, as private companies to realize the expectations that were at the forefront when the government decided some 20 years ago that there was a need to really reform this sector. So I am actually looking forward to, you know, uh, for us to now address some of those specific issues. And I'm sure that it will be a most interesting discussion, you know, with the, the level of um, participation that is expected from this very distinguished panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ify. Gail, you're on. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm here from the UK, and I thought I'd bring a bit of a kind of international perspective to the discussion. The UK um, privatised its electricity industry 30 years ago, um, exactly <laughs> this year. Um, and the one thing I wanted to say is nobody gets it right first time. Um, I think we had about 16 electricity acts, um, constantly refining, reforming. Um, and obviously there's been a lot of learning. There's been a, a study done of the cost benefit of, um, of the privatization. And the key question was, did the consumers, businesses and individuals get better service and cheaper power as a result? And the answer was ultimately yes, but it took time. And the real crux of this was better regulation. So when the regulator really got better data, when the regulator actually started looking at the pricing structure, um, and when the regulator grappled with, and was allowed to grapple with some of the issues like excess profits in some of the utilities, then things changed. And so a key learning that we have is, is about the importance of an empowered, depoliticized regulator who is able to, to make difficult decisions and gets the backing from the rest of the government for the fact that they've done so on a neutral data-based basis. Um, and I think that's one of the things, so we're very keen to support the regulator, not just with consultancy, but with one-to-one -one, um, meetings with the UK regulator for learnings. Um, and I think there are also some good learnings from other parts of Africa of where it's worked well. Uganda's possibly the best example of a long-standing unbundled, deprivatized, unbundled privatized electricity system that has, when it put up its tariffs in about um, 2014 onwards, maybe a bit earlier, 2013, 
that drove a lot of investment. It drove everything from small scale um, uh, remote hydros to some of the larger power projects. And the cost of borrowing for those utilities also came down significantly. Um, so that's what's, when you get it right, eventually, that's, that's the positive side. If you get it wrong, the examples are, for example, South Africa, ESCOM, this can really impact on your entire financial system. Um, remember the Nigerian banks have got a lot vested in the discos in other parts of the, of the electricity economy. Um, so this really matters. And we are all short of money at the moment. Uh, so we have to make tough decisions. Putting the tariff up is something nobody wants to do, but it's been carefully structured to minimize the impact on the poor. I think Minister Zainab put it beautifully. She explained that 60% of the subsidy really goes to the top 20% of, of the population. Um, and remember, there are between 67 and 80 million Nigerians with no power whatsoever, not even on grid power. And in order to get some of those connected to the grid, we need investment in the grid. And we can only get investment in the grid and in those distribution companies if we have more money in the system. That means putting the tariff up and paying bills. And I think when people call for a subsidy in the times of COVID, you have to remember that that means other people can't be subsidized for their healthcare. So it, it is tough times. Um, and it also means um, that you know, we, can't, um, we can't get the investors in that we'd like to. So there is a really significant lead times on power sector investment. Uh, the scoping, the analysis all means that to get a generation deal to fruition is really a three to four year exercise. We know that a lot of the gas fields are closing now earlier than perhaps they would because of the oil crisis. That means that we need to get some companies in to um, invest in, in new gas pipelines and new gas production. Um, and we can only have that on stream in time if they start very, very soon. Yeah. And that means having the tariff increase now because no one's going to come and invest until they know that the tariff is increased, until they can have a power purchase agreement that meets their banking requirements. Yeah. So it's, it's the bankers right now that, that need to see this signal of a tariff increase. They need to see the signal of the reform. And I would really praise the, the really hard work of the Nigerian government who have pushed hard, and particularly Minister Zainab's um, department. I know a whole team there, a whole team in the Chief of Staff's office, in the VP's office, have been working very hard to get the support of the World Bank um, in this. And now they need the support of the rest of Nigeria to say, yeah, we know this is tough. <laughs> um, nobody wants their electricity bills going up. Um, but yeah, the end game yeah. really is better delivery. Um, so there's lots of things we're willing to help on, bringing in investors. We've got some great companies like Connexa who want to do some, some good stuff in Kaduna. We've got some potential solar companies coming in, but a lot of those have money linked to them that will be lost unless these first steps are taken. So we've been really trying to keep $100 million of green climate fund money. The UK is the largest funder of the green climate fund. And that was linked to being able to sign a power purchase agreement for a solar project. So, so at sorry. some point, I need to finish, yeah? Yes, you do. Yeah, so at some point that gets lost. Um, so um, yeah, my, my main messages are, um, you know, it, nothing is perfect, but that doesn't mean you should throw out the kitchen sink. Um, we, we can all work together to get there on a lot of this stuff, private sector, government, donors, et cetera. There's a lot of donor support here. Um, but I think more than anything right now, we just need the, to give the Nigerian government the moral support. That's it from me. Over. Thank you. Fantastic, Gil. Much appreciated. I think we, we, we should get stuck in the uh, Q&A straight away. Now, our conversation today centered around the work of the regulator of the electricity industry. Now, every regulator must be effective. 
meaning there must be a sense of measurable progress and impact, uh, and uh, it must be um, uh, it, it must have a disposition uh, toward learning, whether it's technology adoption, value stimulation, or other things. Uh, and and finally, the regulator must also be predictable. Um, part of the things that we've been talking about around consistency on the subject of the tariff um, and, and the rate making process that signals correctly to investors. These are all important things. So um, I'm going to go first uh, to Rumun. Um, Rumun, perhaps you want to um, speak about the issues around why the tariff still remains so sensitive in the mind of consumers. So maybe talk us through uh, issues around uh, market um, uh, segmentation and 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 give us uh, an idea of why you think uh, there still remains this political interference uh, you know despite the implications on the sector uh, uh, thank you Kenny I, I, I think that um, you know we we have to look at banking the the sector and when I mean banking the sector, at the wholesale level where you have generation companies, it's much easier to provide them a PPA with a guarantees and what have you. And to the extent that we're ready to do that, you could actually have people invest, even though uh, some lenders would actually worry about the whole throughput. So what's going on in, in, uh, in, in distribution is if distribution is not generating the uh, the revenue, does it really make sense to uh, depend on guarantees, uh, which is not sustainable? So to bank it is to actually look at the interplay of revenues and tariff at the retail end. And one of the issues that I've always said is that the tariff does not have any measure of service promise to the consumer. So when we say that we want to increase tariff so that you see a measurable improvement in supply. The question is, what is the supply today, right? So where I live, do I know that I have six hours and therefore when you increase the service and make the investment and maybe in another year or two years, it's going to go to eight hours, right? So I think that lack of clear, um, you know, KPIs, performance indices, that you can say that this is what the tariff is going to do, makes it very difficult to understand why the tariff increase is there. So it's easy to understand what's going on in the wholesale level. It's easy to understand that distribution companies need to make the investments, buy meters, put transformers. Yeah. But for the consumer who's going to pay, there is no clear signal the difference this is going to make, right? So. So it, 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 the people keep saying, I want to see improved service, but what is the baseline? What is the benchmark of what is going to happen, right? So if I live in Guagolada, a suburb of, of Abuja, and maybe we don't have uh, power, if we increase the tariff, would it allow the distribution company uh, have additional capex, which is for capital investment, and extend the line to my community? Right for or extend it to some other place such that my hours of service increases, which is why it is actually a little bit uh, painful that at this time NERC is actually thinking about tariffs that are tied to service levels. You know, so you have four different bands of services. We are not able to get it out because of. Uh, issues of communication, consultation, and every other thing, you know, regulatory making process right. that we need to right. put. But I think that what is very important and why I've had an issue is that when you say cost reflective tariff, what does it mean to the consumer? Is the consumer going to get additional hours of service or what, you know, what does 30 Naira buy you? What is the product, right? So I, I, I just thought that, you know, uh, we can talk about cost reflective tariff we understand what it means, but we have to begin to tie it to some guaranteed and level of service so that the okay. consumer could see exactly where this is going to. So is this why perhaps, you know, because even the government um, personalities who are in government 
are also um, facing the issue of uh, poor electricity service. Is this perhaps why they are not supportive of the uh, tariff increase? And is this why we are seeing the political interference that's happening in the sector? Well, I don't think that that's why politicians, politicians, you know, to a largest extent, you know, um, they get their energy from the people, right? So they, they, they can read the people and read the mood. They read that the, their, their constituents, uh, the people with the votes, the people with the public adulation just finds it that it makes no sense why they should have a tariff increase. So if, for instance, the regulator has said that having worked with the discos, the discos have held their consultation and come back and said that we're going to move the tariff from, say, uh, 14 Naira to 15 Naira, and for everybody who is paying 15 Naira, he's going to move from 12 hours to 16 hours or 18 hours verifiable, I think it would be very difficult to actually, it would be in the hands of the consumers to decide whether they really do not want to pay that additional for the service, right? But without a benchmark, without any promise, you would always have a problem with the tariff being sold to the consumers. I think we must look at what is the level of service tied to uh, different okay. uh, uh, prices. Okay, let me move to, um, to Ify. Ify, I was just wondering, um, in your view and your international experience, are there instances where uh, foreign governments have interfered in the manner in which we see it in Nigeria today. Can you share with us any lessons? Well, thank you, Kenny. Um, uh, let me start from where Rumi had ended. She had, uh, I think when you come to the power sector and you come to tariffs, uh, all over, well, in most parts of the world, especially the developing world, typically, it is a political issue. So I don't think that what is happening in Nigeria today is unusual. Uh, just last year, um, while I was in Ghana, there was supposed to have been a tariffing, actually they, they are, their tariffing increase was built to have happened, I think first uh, about uh, July of 2018. Uh, that didn't quite work out. They moved it to October, that didn't happen. Uh, anyway, it took almost, I think, 18 months before eventually in April, no, in March this year, the tariff that was proposed by the regulator about two years ago was eventually approved and not quite in the form that it was proposed. That is just Ghana here because right. I like to use that because I know that Nigerians like to compare quite a bit with oh, this is what is happening in Ghana, this is what is happening in Nigeria. We, we do. So yeah. um, it is not unusual. It is not unusual because um, remember that when you talk about uh, tariffs, you're talking about the impact on the end users. Remember that even in terms of governance, there's also the social objective of government to ensure, like the minister had said, that the poor customers, the vulnerable customers, that the average person also gets the fair service. And so um, having governments interfere, quote unquote, in the tariff making decision is not unusual, is not unexpected. Indeed, it is actually expected as part of the consultation process in rate making that the regulator also proactively consults with government during that entire process. Because when it comes to the issue of cost, to the issue of whether there will be the, the need, like in the case of Nigeria, for the government to invest quite a bit in terms of subsidies to support a lot of consumers, then they have to be involved. And it's not just in Nigeria. Like I said, it happens in most countries in Africa. I have worked with the ECOWAS Regional Electricity Regulatory Authority, and I know that to a large extent, when it comes okay. to what we refer to as political interference, yeah. the major subject matter where that issue comes up time and time again is the issue of tariff setting. Is it desirable that at all times that we should have that level of, inter uh, of uh, interference, perhaps not. So that is why it would also be useful that part of the regulator's uh, mandate, we must ensure that the consultation process is 
done so in depth that at the time that a story proposal is made, you should make sure that across board, be the consumers understand clearly why that has to be done. So that is why the rate making process all over the world as a regulatory obligation is typically taken very, very seriously. It's not something that is done in a day or two or in a month or two. It is a process that must be done in a way that every key stakeholder is carried along. So in a nutshell, what is happening today in Nigeria is not unusual, it's not peculiar to us as a country. It does happen everywhere. Perhaps it's yeah. not liable that every time it should happen, but I think that there's also the need to ensure effective stakeholder consultation and of course for the government also to now understand that once that has been done then it will be the role of okay. the to right. actually yeah thank you Fee. i think it'd be helpful you know to turn to the honorable minister at this point because the attention that she has to the detail of the electricity sector uh, is, is really quite impressive. And I was just wondering if there are um, particular interventions at this point, you know, um, not just uh, by way of, you know, uh, the, the, the physical, fiscal interventions, but also um, uh, some of the um, political, uh, I guess, you know, considerations that she has, because I know that she would typically not be supportive that the tariff is not going up, given that, um, as, as we hear, she has a light purse and she has very heavy burdens. So, Honorable Minister, it would be helpful if you can give us uh, a, a view of what the interventions are for the private, uh, for, for the electricity sector, one, and two, um, how uh, you're engaging with your colleagues in government, you know, to uh, uh, further the dialogue on the need to increase tariff. Uh, well, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, conversation. Let me just say that the government is not the party that increases tariffs. Tariffs are set by the discourse, but in setting that, uh, those tariffs, discourse are expected to consult widely with the customers. Once they have some understanding with the customers, they now come and make a case to the regulator NERC for approval to amend the tariff. So government does not set tariff. So if tariff changes today, it is the distribution networks that have changed the tariff with the approval of the regulator. But government is closely following this um, uh, process because it's costing us a lot in terms of the liquidity bridge that we provide to the power sector. So we hope that this will happen very, very quickly. Very recently, I think Mr. Uh, Rumu, Rumu has mentioned that the regulator is discussing with the distribution networks to amend the tariff structure such that they consult with their customers and provide power for a certain number of hours and charge a certain number of tariff fee. And that for us is a process that we see that will improve the potential of collections from the sector and reduce the subsidy to us. All we, we, we insist is that when they do that review, that the lifeline tariff of that is the lowest level does not change and they are not affected. So some areas will, uh, the discos are able to offer 20 hours of power and therefore the pay higher rate, some 16 hours, some 12 hours, some eight hours. So the rates are staggered across four different plans. Once the distribution networks have been able to engage their customers and they have those understanding, and we understand that they're looking at uh, customers that are clustered. So maybe you go to an estate that is gated and you are able to communicate with the residents in the estate through a, a certain organization that they have, then that particular estate gets incremental power assured of a certain number of hours, and then they pay the tariff. That is the process that, that uh, we understand is going on now, and we're watching very closely. We hope it works, because if it works, 
will be will mean that there will be improved um, um, efficiency in the right. in the in the provision of the power. There will be more power provided, and there is a chance then that. Uh, with additional liquidity that will be coming in, the distribution networks can now access more financing, which is what they very critically need to be able to uh, invest more in, 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 the, in their networks for improved efficiency. So it's, it's, it's um, like if you said, it takes, it takes a long time. It's yeah. not something that you do by just uh, um, having Absolutely. one or two uh, one or two meetings, and we hope it happens. On our own part, what we're distributing to support uh, this process is, like I said, the regulator has licensed meter asset providers. These are different from the distribution networks. They've been given license that enables them to bring in meters and deploy and hand over the meters to the distribution networks to deploy within their network, and then they recover their investment over a period of time. So we support them with import duty waivers and in some cases, even tax uh, rebates to, en to encourage them to bring in. Uh, uh, we prefer, our preference is for the components, uh, the parts, so that they come and assemble here. But we also said of the proportion that you're bring, going to bring, you can also bring some fully assembled ones, but our, our preference is that you bring in parts so that uh, some value addition also takes place here. There is also uh, there is also the uh, minimum remittance order that has been uh, already implemented by the regulator. They will continue to tweak it and be asking the discos to remit more and more in terms of percentages of their of their collections as yeah. the service is improving. There are a number of things that we've done, including sourcing for funding, which is now the, the World Bank has assured is available to be provided to the distribution networks to invest in the sector. We have the Siemens project, which is deployment of infrastructure along the distribution network and the transmission network to improve on the infrastructure that is required to enhance the performance of uh, power in the sector. There, there's uh, also finally, let me say, there's um, uh, the performance improvement plans, which we uh, uh, which the discos are expected to submit to the regulator, and they have, and the regulator is, is supposed to monitor those performance improvement plans that uh, the distribution networks have, have committed to. So a combination of all of these things will see power improving in the sector, will mean that there will be more financing attracted to the sector, and also yeah. that there will be more investments that are coming into the power sector. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, Gail, can I just turn to you for a second and get your perspective from the UK on uh, the subject that we just um, sidestepped from a moment ago, which is around whether or not um, the uh, government has had a direct say-so on a tariff increase or not. Is, is that something you can briefly address? So um, the government has no influence on on electricity tariffs, except for the nomination of the the regulator, which is actually the same, really, in Nigerian law. Um, so yes, it's it's very much an independent thing. I mean, I think the thing to emphasise is that this is largely, as Minister Zainab said, it it comes from the distribution companies who need the data. It goes to the regulator who needs yeah. the data. Who needs the data. And then you do the maths, you know, it's literally, it should be a formula which looks at costs, it looks at service, um, and it should be a scientific exercise. And what you want is that predictability, both for yeah. the consumers who want to know that the tariff usually will go on, only go up gradually. Um, if you do it constantly, you know, what's happened is we've had long periods without it going up in Nigeria, and now we're gonna to have to do a big jump. Um, but you also want predictability if you're an investor and if you're a, a disco, so whether you're a generator disco, you just need that predictability. But we are where we are at the moment, so we're gonna to have to have a bit of a leap of faith. And I do, I do think that we sort of have these polarized discussions around, could we link tariff to performance 
Well, you can sort of, and that's what you can do with, you know, you can deliver as a disco, you can deliver better energy to people who are paying. Remember, it's not just about tariff, it's also about people who pay. Right. Um, you know, I used to live in Kosovo and we had tremendous power cuts and I ran a business in Kosovo with, with power cuts and I had to waste my time running out to the generator and turning it on and it was freezing cold there in the, in the winter and very hot in the summer. And people who lived in areas that paid more did get better service but at, at a certain point you need this leap of faith where you you have to put the tariff up a bit before the service improvement comes um but i feel we could kind of debate the the tariff till the cows come home we kind of need to move we need to just do it and move on um everyone will have an opinion on how we could improve this bit of the tariff or that bit of the tariff or improve this service or whatever time is money and at some point, you just gotta, you just gotta do it. Right, the bullet. Okay, thank you very much, Rumu. Uh, the, the regulator typically would um, implement government policy, um, but every time there is the sense that um, there is an interference uh, politically, uh, the implementation of those policies that are even set out by the government itself, you know, tend to take a bad turn. Um, how bad, in your view, is this political interference in, 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 in Nigeria? If you can cite some examples, that'll be, that'll be even better. But, you know, how have you seen that impact on, on the industry? Well, okay. Um, so let's define what you mean uh, by political interference. Because you remember that the regulator in itself, though independent, it, um, it's part of the government to some extent, right? Uh, and therefore, that's why it would take some policy directives from the executive, and then it has oversight from the legislature, uh, mm -hmm. as you know. Uh, the, the, I, I think that political interference, and, and, and people who have more international experience, Gail and Ife have talked about it, it's not uh, just uh, a case of Nigeria, but you know, I, I think in my opening remarks, I made the, uh, the point that private capital thrives only where there is predictability and what have you, right? Uh, and therefore, uh, once you begin to have that, it underpins everything. In 2015, for instance, just before the election, uh, yeah. there was this reversal by the regulator of a tariff that had uh, been put in place that was going to see the transitional, transitional electricity market coming. Uh, we had gone to the extent of aggregating uh, payment guarantees from distribution companies and we we're going to assign them to the uh, generation companies. And once that happened, you know, it underpinned everything. We started trying to cobble it together. And then 2016, we were very close. And then there was a, an intervention from the courts and that was total free fall. And from that point, uh, totally, we did not have um, any basis for uh, contracts in the market or expectations, right? So when that happens, it, it, it typically would uh, take away the foundations of financing for, for an industry. Uh, you can imagine uh, an investor who is sitting in front of his bank are talking about a long-term credit. And we're talking about credits of that would take about uh, 12 years long-term money uh, and for equity, it might actually go out to 20 years to recover all the, all the returns. And then yeah. uh, things like this happen, it, it totally uh, makes it very difficult. I, I, I think there are so many credit lines that we see and uh, so many investors who are standing to make investments in generation. Uh, yeah. You have the uh, 5,000 megawatts that NNPC is looking to do with its um, partners. You have the solar projects, you have... Uh, uh, different QIPPs and, and the rest of them on my power. There are quite a lot in the generation space that are looking to uh, make the investments and then you have gas producers also and then at the distribution end. So when the interference comes, um, usually they come to help the consumer, but ultimately uh, it would not help. So um, the consultation that goes on within government between the regulator and uh, especially uh, the arm of government that has the oversight function, which is the uh, legislator, um, or, you know, needs 
uh, they need to talk to each other because that usually uh, that is where uh, most of this would come from uh, as you expected yeah. because okay. uh, these are the people who are closer to the consumers yeah thank you if what can we do different to improve the perception of um, consistent you know regulation in the industry Because we talked about it earlier, um, about how a, a good regulator needs to be consistent and the perception that investors can come in um, and, and be assured uh, that they're, they're going to recoup the investments over time. I just want, what can we do different today in the industry to, to strengthen uh, a better position? Okay. Yeah, you, you're right that uh, it's very important that, uh, you know, to attract investment and to give it confidence you need you know, within the sector, then the regulatory consistency is key, really. Um, I know we've struggled quite a bit, I think, especially in the last few years, basically, in terms of um, building that kind of confidence that, you know, and that is required in terms of the regulatory interference and the regulatory inputs to ensure that they privatize the power sector operates the way that it was planned to. Uh, so what can be done differently? Uh, I think uh, from our point of view, uh, one of the key issues that we might need to improve on has been talked about already by other panelists. Uh, consultation, stakeholder engagement, that is so important. It is key. Uh, yeah, political interference could be minimized. I think uh, might also help today to improve um, the regulatory environment, you know, is the need for a more stringent regulatory impact assessment in terms of um, whether you know that is post uh, regulatory impact assessment or pre basically for instance we've talked about this uh, new tariff uh, proposal that's been you know that we talked about perhaps for those that know it might be a way out but you realize that there's a huge gap in terms of information coming consumers in terms of what is the impact of this why is it being done and even on the part of government really or even on the part of the number of stakeholders but what this essentially means is that for the regulator to be able to carry along all the key stakeholders we have to invest a lot more on the consultation process leading to any rule making process right. and even after those rules have been made typically what is expected is two, three, four years down the line after you've had a regulation and it's not working, then it's also important to perhaps do also a post-evaluation, you know, a, a, a real thorough impact assessment to find out why hasn't this worked the way it was intended. Perhaps yeah. there was something we missed or that things have changed because I remember that the power sector itself keeps evolving day by day. Today we talk about energy access, renewable energy, which were not the key issues. 10 years ago, but today is big. So it also yeah. means that the regulator yeah. has to be innovative, the regulator has to be very, very knowledgeable, has to be able to move in tandem or better still ahead of the market, of the utilities, of the operators, in order to be able to address those issues. A knowledgeable, uh, a knowledgeable regulator who shows empirically to all stakeholders the basis for all rulemaking processes would end up being a well-respected regulator. Yeah. Whether you agree with yeah. some decisions or not, yeah. but you can at least understand the basis mm -hmm. why those decisions are made. And I think that in doing this consultation, we shouldn't just look at the fact that we are talking to those who are very knowledgeable in the industry. Remember that majority of our consumers Majority of the, key st so, yeah, of the key stakeholders are just common people who, like it, we have said that you need to talk to them in a language that they understand. We might need to work with consumer advocacy groups, find ways of engaging people at every level to ensure yeah. that our rulemaking process 
goes through the kind of rigor yeah. that is required both before any regulation is made and subsequently years afterwards, no, yeah. maybe like a couple of years afterwards, like uh, Gail had said, the process in the UK took quite a while because there was need for, you know, to review some of those things time and time again. Just to say, where are we? Why have we not gotten to the objectives that we needed to get to? What performance indicators we need to put in place to guide us to ensure that quarterly, periodically, we so are easy. monitoring and evaluating yes. the regulatory yeah. performance. So the regulator also needs to have in-house some form of monitoring process that's slow and that ensures that it also meets its own objective in the regulatory yeah. market. So, so my understanding is with respect to consultation that um, NERC is already actively doing this. I, I, I'm aware that there, there are very um, uh, difficult uh, processes, but that they already uh, undertake this. I just wonder if something is missing and if, Gail, if you can give us a perspective on, uh, on, on, on the question that I asked around th this issue. Is there something that we might be missing in the industry? Uh, and, and is this something that the NIAF program has an appetite to support, you know, just in terms of making sure that there is far less, you know, regulatory intervention or that there is far more regulatory consistency, you know, just in terms of the tariff process? So I think both NIAF and several of the other donors are very keen to support the regulator um, to make this both a more consultative process, as Ify has alluded to, but also a more scientific, analytical process. Um, they need The regulator is short of data at the moment and short of systems. So the regulator needs to know more about who its customers are. Yeah what the payments are, et cetera. So we are really very keen to support it with this, this data, et cetera. Um, so that this becomes more of a scientific analytical process than a political one that everyone has an opinion on. Um, I think that's, that's probably the crux of it. I know in the chat, a lot of people have got questions on, on meters. Um, I don't know if you're going to come on to that one, Kenny, over. Indeed, we'll, we'll, we'll take them on in the question and answer session. But um, I think for now, I, 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 I want to go back to the uh, Honourable Minister on the question around, you know, um, there, there is a very strong involvement, and rightly so, by the Ministry of, Power, uh, Ministry of um, uh, Budget, uh, um, Budget National Planning, uh, Finance Budget and National Planning. Uh, I was just wondering if the Minister um, can give us... Um, a sense of her own pulse on the industry. How uh, optimistic are you, Honourable Minister? And, and do, do you envisage significant improvements over uh, the next um, few years, considering you know the interventions that you've spoken of? And how do we make sure that these aren't railroaded as we uh, implement them? So let me speak um, on this, just relating to the financing aspects of the power sector. We have uh, been working together with the sector to improve on payment discipline. And uh, lately, we have worked together with the power sector as a very close committee to enforce, uh, collectively agree to enforce a central collection system where each of the distribution networks pulls its collections at the bank where they have borrowed from. So these funds are pulled in one pool that will now be um, distributed in the form of a watershed. And so the distribution will include settlement to the generating companies, settlement to TCN, uh, settlement for taxes, settlement to NBET, um, and, then certain, uh, and then a proportion for the distribution networks themselves. What this is going to do is it's going to help us on, on the government side as well as the banks that really uh, literally almost own this business because the discos have, uh, they own them so much and not faring well in terms of servicing. 
So we will be able to see where our estimation is that we'll be able to see more collections in the pool. And therefore, to en enhance our ability to increase our settlement capability, and even for the distribution networks, we will end up getting more. This has to be backed up, of course, with metering to ensure that customers are happy paying for the uh, consumption that they actually, um, uh, uh, they actually made, and then reinforcing uh, also, this will be reinforced by the NERC, by NERC's minimum remittance order. So the minimum remittance order regulation has been set since early this year, and NERC is supposed to periodically change the proportion of remittances that is supposed to be um, minimum remittance by from each uh, from each distribution network. So I think a combination of all of this will see the sector. Um, realizing enhanced liquidity um, with the banks seeing their, their, finance, their, their loans being paid back, they will be more amenable and also with them, with the banks seeing the flows coming in, they will be more amenable to finance the distribution networks so that they can invest more in, uh, in, uh, for improved service. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Um, at this point, uh, we are going to uh, uh, invite the audience um, to submit their questions on the platform. A lot of it have already been, um, uh, or, or a lot of them are already being submitted. So thank you very much. Um, and then, of course, uh, we will take those questions and we will invite the speakers again to address some of the questions. Okay. Uh, so there, there is a question here that says, um, the tariff has always been a problem in the energy sector across the world. And the w only way forward is government has to play an intermediary role as the body that regulates the benchmark of the price to buy and sell energy. This is obviously, uh, this regulates according to the standard energy sales. Sorry, that... Uh, a rendering or that uh, uh, I, I guess you know was not very clear in terms of what question the person is asking okay um, we'll take a few questions please bear with me and just need to line them up Okay. All right. So I'm I'm going to read out a few of the questions that have been um, that, that have been submitted. Um, so th there's there's a question from Eniola uh, that says, "Nice plan, Minister. Uh, Minister, please. What are the setup plans that you have to make sure that the plans will be executed on time? Um, because when um, the on serious people are placed in certain positions, things may not work well. There's another question for you, Honorable Minister. It says, what is the government doing to make access to alternative energy sources like solar easy for consumers in terms of funding? Honorable Minister, you're very popular. The questions okay. are... Oh, okay. Should I? Should I? Okay, you're still going on. Okay. Right. I was just going to uh, uh, put maybe two or three, but you know, if, okay. if you prefer, if you prefer, you can answer those two first, and then we can we can put put up a few more questions. Oh, okay. Um, I think the first question is what is what are we doing to ensure that um, everybody, let me put it simply, does what they're supposed to do. That's why we have the power sector. Uh, reform uh, program. The plan has detailed out activities that will be undertaken by each party. So the Ministry of Power has what they're supposed to do. Finance has what they're supposed to do. There's an expectation from TCN, from the GENCOs, from the DISCOs, and from the regulator. The regulator has also accept, called for and received performance improvement plans from the distribution networks. 
which they're supposed to also monitor and ensure the implementation of these plans. On our own part, on the finance part, we've started this payment discipline program that has, um, um, uh, that, that, that will soon be finalized and we'll, our target is to ensure that we meet some certain levels of collection um, uh, targets. Let, let me uh, say on the, on the issue of alternative power, we have um, started some deployment of solar power. I think um, Gail mentioned that there are some investments that are ready for lining up for some actions that need to be taken. But most recently, with the approval of the Economic Sustainability Plan, one of the initiatives that we have in the plan is to deploy uh, up to 5 million solar home systems to be able to reduce the gap of the unserved Nigerians that don't have power at all. Earlier on, I said there is an estimate that we have up to 80 million Nigerians that don't have any access to electricity. This 5 million power, uh, power um, home systems will be supplying at the minimum 25 million Nigerians. So that would greatly reduce this deficit that we have. This is a program that is designed to support the private sector to be able to provide the service. So it's not government that is going to provide it. And then this is, this are, this is power that is not going on the grid. It's simply a home system that, will be, uh, that people can buy access and take to homes. They pay using airtime or any other mode that the vendors decide to to deploy. All the regulator has to do yeah. is to make sure that the prices are fair yeah. and that the tariff is reasonable. Yeah. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, Gail, you wanted to uh, in interject on the second question. Yeah, I wanted to come in on solar home systems in particular. So um, solar home systems is something that I personally, but also um, DFID has worked on since, for the last 10 years. Um, uh, and we had a sort of 66 million pound uh, program to support solar home systems and mini grids, which is just coming to a close. So we started it in 2014. Um, we also have a lot of UK companies really interested in the space. MCOPA, um, which is, uses the, the pay-as-you-go system, Azuri, B-Box, who are very big in Nigeria. Um, all of them want to expand. Um, it's a brilliant solution for the rural poor in particular, because um, as the Honourable Minister says, you have basically a solar panel and a box, yeah. but it's not a lot now with um, low energy TVs, fans, etc. But I think a really key element here is, you know, if, if this was going to happen, it would have happened. Yeah. What's the quest? The question is why haven't the five million already got installed? And I think we need to look at the policy challenges around helping those get to five million installations, which is about twenty-five million new connections. That would be fantastic. It's a wonderful ambition for the sixty-seven to eighty million Nigerians without power um, in rural areas where the grid will almost often never meet, never reach. Um, and I think there are some really important policy changes we need to get those solar home systems installed. Firstly is the fact that they're still subject to customs tariffs. So um, when you import a solar home system, you pay between 10 and 50% to customs. Um, and the complaint of the systems importers is people are still importing diesel generators, which are a lot less climate friendly. Yeah. And, and through without paying customs duty. So it's yeah. a it's an unfair market. Um, and in the climate conferences, there was an undertaking by most countries to remove tariffs on solar. So that's one issue. A second one is the sheer blockages in customs. When you talk to some of the companies like NIO, which is a great distributor, they'll tell you, you know, it takes them four or five months to get their stuff out of customs and they have to pay large fees to move the containers. And then thirdly is the is the payment issue. So the reason that mobile, that solar home systems have taken off in East Africa so well is because of the penetration of really good mobile money systems. You pay as you go, you pay less than kerosene. 
so that you don't even have to worry about tariff because basically the payment is set so low by yeah. the vendors. It's in their interest to make it cheaper than kerosene. You yeah. go to a shop, you get the whole system, and all you do is you literally pay as you go. But to do that, you need proper mobile money. So the vendors tell us that the problem in Nigeria is you have itsy bitsy mobile money, bit here, bit there, but we have the lowest penetration of mobile money in Africa almost now. So even Ethiopia's catching up. Um, and so like full licenses for the payment service banks, which I think are sitting on the desk of the central bank at the moment would really help here. And then licensing some of the big vendors. So the larger payment service banks, like the MTNs, the Airtels, they would make a big difference. The banks are never going to serve the poor because they're not lucrative enough for them. But the telcos will do it because they've done it in the rest of Africa. Yeah. And we need a telco that's got a big enough penetration to really make it economically viable to get those solar home systems up and running. Okay. So I'm very mindful right now when we put policies forward for the federal government, we need to try and make them revenue neutral or revenue generating because yeah. a lot of, of fiscal cash knocking around. But there are some policies like this, like the, the payment service banks that wouldn't cost the revenue anything. I understand customs tariffs bring in revenue, so we need to find other solutions to make up the difference. But things like the payment service banks would actually be revenue generating long term for the exchequer. Okay. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Honourable Minister, a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is really very blunt. It says, are we to expect a tariff increase before January 2021? And uh, the second one is for you, uh, Honourable Minister. Is the government going to wait until it resolves all challenges with the problems facing the power industry before engaging you know, a further investment in generation? Or will it push for such investment simultaneously as it resolves the sector problems? Well, um, let me start from the second question. Um, and, and it's whether we're going to solve all the problems before engaging more um, possibilities of more investments. No, there is no way we can resolve all the problems. We're trying to prioritize the problems and solve one at a time or as quickly as we can. But we're very confident that once we're able to reach a cost-reflective tariff, then the investments will come. The investments will come, whether it is financing for the existing investments or fresh investments, they will come. But it's a process. It's not something you do overnight. And no, I cannot say that by uh, Q1 2020, uh, before 2021, there will be tariff increase because it's not government that is controlling the tariff increase. It is the discourse with the approval of the regulator now. So it's not government that decides today the tariff goes up or down. No, it's not. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Rumo, you may want to uh, assist with this one. Uh, it says, uh, good evening, if I may. We got the um, privatization off on the wrong foot when the supposed investors funded their bids from within the economy. That is from the Nigerian banks. Capital should have been imported just like was done with GSM licenses. The foreign um, funding source would have helped the discos and Jenkos as well as the local uh, DMBs to have more room to finance equipment purchase. Most of the inherited transformers need replacement, which in turn would have improved services to the customers. Uh, I wonder if you can react to that. Um, I, um, I just cautiously back to uh, kind of disagree uh, because, you know, for the privatization, there was a, a worldwide tour. I, I think the BP and the federal government went on a, on a road show uh, to Dubai, London, New York, South Africa, trying to sell this to investors, right? So it's a matter of comfort. Uh, and you can imagine what has happened between then and now, especially looking at the Naira and the dollar, you can imagine the type of pressures it would have put if those investments uh, actually did come from 
outside of the country, right? So the, the pressure would have been much more on the industry on that. What, yeah. what, what you could say and what actually one had, could have expected is that the local banks and local investors will take the first plunge and then on the back of, a, of an industry, there will be growth and then there will be additional capital that will come in. So that is what you would have expected because the risk uh, is quite different from that of GSM. So if we had gotten off on the right path, what you would expect is that there will be some form additional capital that will come in forms of debt and equity yeah. to join what is already there. So I don't think that the mistake is not starting with uh, offshore capital, but the whole thing is that we had that, uh, the teething problems, it's, uh, it's lasted too long. Right? right, because if we had a stable environment and you know the industry took off as everyone expected, then by this time you would actually see the capital coming, as we are still seeing in GSM. People who did not participate the first time yeah. actually yeah. try to come back after uh, the period. So I, I I beg to disagree that is the strategy where we went to. Rather, it is how the industry has transitioned since we privatized and today and. You know, this is one of the sides of the conversation of how to make it right so that we can see that capital investment come in. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Minister, the question is, how does the government plan to monitor the uh, proposed intervention funds uh, intended to be injected into DISCOs, GENCOs, and TCN? And the second question is really around uh, renewable energy and the importation process. What actions is the finance ministry doing or taking to engage the Ministry of uh, 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 Power and Customs in streamlining the import process for renewable energy equipment to stimulate that subsector? Um, on the first question, the uh, proposed intervention is coming. So there are two parts. There's intervention that is coming by way of financing from the World Bank for the distribution networks. Yeah. And we will be working with the World Bank and the distribution network to agree very clear performance linked indicators because it's, a, it's going to be a P4R uh, facility. You have to perform a certain level of action to be able to act, uh, access a certain level of finance. And that's not something we'll do alone. We'll do it together with the distribution network. So which yeah. means you're not getting the money until you do ABC. You get the first tranche. Then when you do uh, the next level of actions, then you get another one. So we're going to have very clear DLIs for, for, for that uh, financing. Yes. On uh, the what we need to do to make it easier, more uh, beneficial for investors to bring in equipment relating to a renewable energy sector. We will look into the issues of uh, maybe additional uh, tariff concessions, sorry, import waiver concessions for those equipment. And also we're currently working uh, with all the port authority actors to resolve the problem of uh, the congestion in our ports. So it's not just the Nigerian customs alone. It's all the operators yeah. in the customs. We have a very serious problem uh, in the port. The Nigerian Ports Authority, the Customs Service, the MASA, they're all working together now as a task team to ease that problem so that goods will come in uh, faster and clear quicker. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, we put out a poll um, to our online viewers. Um, everyone's online, by the way. Yes. So, the, the, and, and the question was very, uh, it was a single question. Should NERC increase tariff if it will lead to improved service to customers? And we have um, uh, an 84% uh, yes response and a uh, 16% no response. Thank you very much to everybody who's participated in the poll. Um, and I, I want to just go back to our, um, our speakers. 
and ask if you please start to turn focus on your closing remarks. Um, we'll give you a bit of time to uh, just go through that. Uh, um, but we still welcome questions from our audience at this point. But I want to just ask um, uh, if uh, there are any, uh, in, in, in your mind, Honorable Minister, you know, uh, the, the electricity sector must be one of those sectors of the economy that, you know, uh, keeps you up at night, um, wondering, okay, we need to do this. And, we, and, and I know that you've spoken to a lot of the answers that, that you have. Are there any particular areas in which, you know, um, uh, you, you feel like um, uh, the... The, the generality of Nigerians do not really understand uh, uh, the complexity so that you have opportunity to speak to those now. Are there, are there well, any particular the, areas? Yeah. The electricity industry, the way it's structured now, is we have the generation arm of the industry that generates the power. This power is transmitted by the transmission network and uh, it's now um, sold to the discos. And then we have an embed standing in between that is certain invoices uh, within, the, within the sector. That for me is a, is a point where we are right now and I hope we'll be able to resolve it that in the future, maybe in the next couple of years, that settlement process will be done by a private sector player rather than by government. Either that or we move to a situation where the generation companies and the distribution companies are having bilateral agreements and buying and selling power between themselves. So that is something that really uh, is of great concern to me and I hope we'll be able to resolve it in one of these two ways in, in the short to me, in the medium term horizon. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Rumo, can I invite you uh, now for your closing remarks? Uh, Honorable Minister, I will invite you last for that, please. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, it's been an uh, interesting conversation. Uh, I've gotten some insight, especially uh, uh, some comforting uh, information coming from the, uh, the Honorable Minister and uh, a confirmation that the government is still, um, is very much committed to seeing the sector uh, do better and is going to support it with uh, uh, some of the, uh, of the treasury. Uh, for everyone watching, I think uh, one of the things when it comes to regulator is to engage in all these consultations that go, go out and, and be supportive. And I, I, I think that uh, we'll, we'll get there uh, for the regulator, the regulator uh, to a large extent uh, needs to be stronger, firmer, uh, more transparent, uh, because that way it could also uh, push back on in, uh, interferences uh, where it is very clear that it understands what it is doing. So its competence, transparency, and ability to, um, to carry uh, the stakeholders uh, will be very helpful. Um, I will join the regulator and the, uh, and the government to actually ask their support for these service level uh, tariffs. It's very important that tariffs that are being put to consumers should have a measure of service. It should be cost reflective. It should pay for all the, um, uh, for the input cost of delivering power to homes and businesses, but at the same yeah. time, it must have value to consumers. I, I, I just say this because if he had talked about simple communication, uh, the cost of things at times might not be the value of them, right? So in simple form, if it costs you a, a thousand naira to make a pot of soup and you add 20 naira salt instead of five naira salt, it will still cost you a thousand, but it will be worth very little to you. So it, we should not only look at the cost of service, but we have to look at what value it is when it's delivered to consumers. Uh, the, the person who leaves his house by 8, p 8 a.m. in the morning and returns by 6, it is meaningless if power comes to the person by 10 a.m. in the morning and goes away at 4, right? So yeah. it's the same thing. We have to think about what is the value of the 
service that is being provided such that it could be tied to a cost-reflective uh, tariff. And um, yeah. once again, I want to thank Electricity Hub for this opportunity and um, uh, to everyone who has uh, participated uh, in this seminar. Thank you, Ramu. If he had, I invite you now for your closing remarks, please. Thank you. So uh, um, in closing, uh, I think I just want to reiterate the fact which uh, Gil had made at the beginning that um, it's important that, uh, you know, and that, you know, and I will all give this entire process the time that it needs to be able to deliver on our expectations. I think it's important that um, the regulator especially plays a critical role in managing that expectation of the customers especially. Uh, issues of tariff, issues of uh, government interference and uh, policy somersaults um, are part of some of the challenges that are usually encountered when you begin a reform process such as we are embarking on today. If we look at uh, countries in uh, Southern America that started this process in the 90s and uh, even from, for some obviously it led to reversal of the process, but for a lot more, what it meant was that along the way, there was a need to innovate, there was a need for the regulator especially to drive that, that process. So I'm glad when I hear that uh, there are kinds of, um, you know, uh, offers on ground to help in strengthening the regulatory process. Let us also uh, not forget that the regulator in Nigeria really is not really that old. You know, NEC came on board in 2005. And uh, from what I've seen, especially within the continent, yes, back here, you know, we do actually talk about the need to create but it is also important to know that uh, while we do the regulatory benchmarking, NEC hasn't done as badly as a number of other regulators in the region. I think not too long ago, the AFDB uh, published uh, a regulatory in this uh, benchmark. I mean, yes, in some areas there was need for certain improvement, but certainly NEC was, you know, uh, came and uh, not anywhere near the bottom you know, when it comes to the ranking of the regulators uh, in Africa. So I think it's important, uh, as has been emphasized before, consultation should be based on empirical facts. There's need to work more on data to be able to show, you know, to be able to convince all key stakeholders that the decisions that are made by the regulator are based on empirical data. I think that is important. Knowledge is key. A knowledgeable regulator, like I say, commands the kind of due respect that has to be done. And in saying that again, I also think that even as the government too is also concerned in the appointment of regulators, we should also be quite uh, clear that even those appointments, I will make sure that we no longer, I mean, that this is no longer the, the time for us to, to be doing trial and error. I yeah. think that we are lucky to come from a country where you have a lot of people who will be able to do this. So even in the appointment of the commissioners, I just want to lend my voice that the government should also be a lot more circumspect in the sense that we must make sure that we have people who are competent enough to drive this sector moving forward. Because five years is not, uh, is not time enough for you to learn and implement. So you should still have an idea of what it is that you need needs to do so that you come in and in five years you are up and doing because I can also see that that is part of the challenge you've had at really so I think it's important that we make sure we do the right heads and right holes we also yeah. ensure that we require so that when we make those decisions everybody comes you know, we're satisfied that the regulator has, in fact, put its weight behind and is knowledgeable about what he's doing. Thank you very much. And thanks again for this opportunity to be part of this distinguished panel. Thank you, Ify. Uh, Gail, uh, please make your closing remarks and recommendations. 
so I'm going to be brief. Um, I think my job is to help. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Um, ultimately, it's a decision uh, for Nigeria on the tariff. But I just say, take the leap. You know, you're never going to have the certainty of will everything improve? Will everything be perfect? It won't. Um, but I do think the eyes of all the investors are on this decision right now. Um, the eyes of the international community also. So I hope the tariff goes up. Um, but it's not all about the on-grid. It's also about the rural poor who, who need those solar home systems. And on that, you know, my recommendation there is very much um, uh, if we can have some policy changes. It's then our job as UKA to step in and support, but also bring in the UK investors. So we do have a great offer of UK investors lined up for on grid, um, both gas and solar. Um, also, investors like Connexa who are interested in improving the service at the distribution level. Um, but we also have some great companies on the off grid side, and we have UK Export Finance willing to help CDC, which is our development finance initiative. Um, but we can't make the policy changes. We need the policy changes to do the signal to bring in the investors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Honorable Minister, uh, we welcome your uh, closing remarks and recommendations, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kenny. Uh, the Nigerian electricity supply industry is uh, one of the sectors that receives the most attention in government right now. Government cannot afford any inaction and um, the sector has been in a crisis mode for a very long time with poor service delivery and also the sector hasn't, ha haven't been financially uh, viable. Government is burdened by um, funding of uh, tariff shortfalls. This is scarce resources that would have been better applied to human capital development, to education, to health. So we're working with the industry and with the regulator to see how we can bring about improvements and how we can bring about improvements quickly. We do hope the distribution networks and the regulator is able to bring about a review of the tariff so that we are able to improve in the, on the collections that are coming in from, from this sector. We're also working with um, the oil and gas industry to ensure that there's more gas supplied to, so, to, to increase the power to, 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 to the country. We do um, also have policies in place that are meant to encourage alternative power, uh, especially clean energy like solar, and, but we are willing to um, I am asking for support, Gail, because he said that's what you do. Uh, if we have to revise and improve on any policies to enable more investments to come in, into uh, into the uh, into the clean energy energy sector, we have um, done a lot within a very short period of time. Unfortunately, because these are things that will not have landing onto consumer see increase in in uh, the quality or the efficiency of the service. They don't, they, they don't see, know the amount of work that has been done. But we've been, we have, there's a presidential committee that has been broken up into different sectors, uh, into work groups, each work group uh, packing a number of issues and to, to, to address them. And in each of these work groups, we're working with the private sector, the businesses that are uh, in, in, in the sector. And a lot of progress has been made in that regard. Is I know what you say about having to improve. Um, uh, maybe this is now NERC has to improve the way it goes about its campaigning, uh, educating people on what has been done, um, on, or even what needs to be what needs to be done. We've always been told that we have a gap in our uh, in our communications um, uh, efforts, and we'll try to do more of that. I'm glad and really excited by the results of this polls. Um, and when they did the first uh, roadshow together with the discourse, 
that's the result that they came back with. They said consumers are saying, we don't mind if you increase tariff, but we do expect to have better uh, service. And, and that's fair enough. And so we all have to work together to make sure this better service is realized and that we are subsequently uh, seeing an industry that has cost reflective tariff. Thank you very much, uh, Nigeria Electricity Hub, for inviting me to uh, participate with this excellent panel that you have, Iki, uh, Gail, and uh, Mr. Wonoji. Uh, it's been nice meeting you, and, and also, Kenny, thank you very much for excellent moderation. Have a good one. Thank you, Honorable uh, Minister. So at this, at this point, um, I'm just going to uh, provide like a brief summary of um, our discussions today and perhaps uh, focus more on the uh, recommendations that have been made. Um, so first of all, uh, there was a conversation around market segmentation, the need to improve the um, value proposition around service delivery and the service promise to be clearly or better better communicated to consumers, uh, to government, by the regulator um, as, as much as possible. The, the regulator needs uh, to improve its perception as being stronger, firmer, uh, transparent, and hold um, the management uh, around uh, 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 around the tariff and rate making also needs to be improved. Uh, we talked about um, the need to avoid policy somersaults, uh, which are not, by the way, uh, uh, unusual, uh, but there is a need for us to just move on and stop referencing the past and uh, to take the bull by the horn. There's a need for us to do what we must to develop the industry, um, to be mindful that the industry is nascent. Uh, and there is uh, still a lot that needs to be achieved. So we, we don't need to um, dwell on the fact that we are still where we are, uh, but the road ahead is very positive. Um, there's a need to improve uh, consultations and um, to provide empirical facts and uh, data, uh, you know, to support the uh, regulatory process. And a knowledgeable regulator uh, needs to, uh, I, I guess, the, 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 the embedding of uh, the regulatory process it must be on the basis of knowledgeable regulators who are appointed based on experience and competency. Um, there's a need to balance uh, policy around on-grid and off-grid um, uh, electricity uh, and, and so there is a need for governments to improve its actions around uh, sector viability, but also in doing so to consider the off-grid sector as well. Um, so there, there are all also uh, conversations around the offer of uh, support uh, by the UK DFID, as mentioned by Gail in the conversation today, uh, and, and the Honourable Minister pointed out uh, uh, a number of uh, significant ongoing interventions in the sector, including the power sector recovery program, and of course, the uh, DISCO intervention, amongst others, which will turn around the sector. So there is a significant amount of work that is being done uh, in government, by government and the regulator, to see that the sector does turn around imminently. So, uh, uh, I think ultimately we're looking forward to a sex sector that is far more vibrant, far more uh, uh, effective, just in terms of providing light to uh, the, uh, the to the people of Nigeria. So I think I'm going to stop on that note. There has been uh, a very useful conversation today. Hopefully, the takeaways to our audience have been very valuable. And at once at this point, again, just th thank our um, uh, our speakers today and, and uh, to appreciate on behalf of the Nigeria Electricity Hub uh, for your participation today. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Gwona at this point. Thank you very much, Mr. Anoue, and thank you very much to our panelists, um, Honorable Minister, 
it's really a pleasure to have you on this platform and we're excited with all the things that you've you know you've revealed here you've talked about all the plans and we absolutely love them thank you very much miss um waranda it's last minute notes what you delivered and we're really appreciative um thank you mr rumu thank you mrs ifi and our, on our dear moderator um before we go i'm just going to um also recognize the DG of, of Naptin, who attended the dialogue, and he had sent his regards. That's uh, Ahmed Bolaji Nagode. Thank you for joining, um, and to NTA for your participation online, uh, sharing the content that we're putting out here as well. Um, we have, a, we have a, a, a podcast series that we've launched recently, two podcast series actually that we launched recently. One of them called On The Grid, which is what focuses on pretty much, you know, the, the grid electricity supply, like what we're discussing now. And then there's another one called uh, The Green Circle, focuses on renewables and um, the, everything about the green transition. So we encourage everyone to subscribe. It's out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, and our podcast platform, Spotify as well, and um, SoundCloud. Um, so thank you again for joining. We will be sharing the reports as usual, um, and we will we will um, we'll, we'll communicate to everyone and um, keep in touch. For once, for the last time, thank you on behalf of Nigeria Electricity Hub. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a Thanks. good evening.